We're pleased to present the second portion of the program, which is the impact of civil rights. So in this portion, we are really very pleased to present um, four very dynamic and knowledgeable speakers. First is G. Michael Payton, the Executive Director of the Ohio Civil Rights Commission. He, as a leader of uh, Ohio's Fair Housing Enforcement Agency, this presenter will discuss the impact of fair housing laws and the status of fair housing opportunities some 50 years after the enactment of the Federal Fair Housing Act. Also, we will have Justice Evelyn Stratton, who will who will talk about the intersection of mental illness, housing, and the criminal justice system. She will discuss the barriers on the exist, uh, that exist on housing um, with landlords unwilling to rent to those with mental illness, especially coupled with a criminal history. Present that Ohio is working on to resolve through a project she is involved with called the Stepping Up Ohio Project. Additionally, we are lucky to have Edward Foreman, civil rights attorney with Marshall and Foreman. He will talk about the role of private litigation in the enforcement and preservation of civil rights. He'll include some explanations both on the power of litigation as a tool and its significant limitations. Also, he will present some ideas for improving and protection with uh, a private litigation framework. And we also have our Franklin County Auditor, Clarence Mingo, who will discuss the complex history of race relations in society and why fears continues to be the leading cause that impedes progress. His, pre his presentation will also mark a path towards progress and the potential future of all of us inclusively working together. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First, let me say that uh, I only have 10 minutes, so I'll just get to the lowdown this morning. Um, your profession plays a very, very vital and important role in enduring fair housing and equal opportunity. You have done so for 50 years. I'm here today to ask you to continue your pursuit of excellence and ensuring that we have equal opportunity and fair housing. Because you see, housing, and I think each and every one of you would agree with me, is very, very central to this notion of, as the judge would say, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I just want to talk to you about where we live today. Um, because in America here, where one lives materially influences the quality of our schools, the type of education we want for our kids. You're talking about such things as access to quality jobs. We're talking about such things as access to medical care. And last but not least, certainly, where we shop and spend our hard-earned money. So when that is affected, it goes to the whole heart of the American dream. Now, we all have three dimensions in our life. I just want to talk about one today since I only have 10 minutes, and that's where we live. But if I were to ask each and every one of you um, about when you grew up, for example, I submit to you that a home is something more than just a place that protects us from the elements. It is actually a place in which memories we have deeply it's memories. Each and every one of you, if you're like me, I can remember, for example, where I lived when I was 10, 11, and 12. I can remember such things as the aroma of my mother's cooking. And I can remember such things as birthdays. I remember what I wore in the prom, actually. Don't want to tell you that either. Uh, with, I think of aunts and uncles. I think of anniversaries. What I'm getting at is a home is a very, very important 
place in our lives. And that's true regardless of whether you live in a hovel or you live in a gated community. So when that right is frustrated, it has great, great psychic and emotional distress damages. And I see the fair lady sitting here today, Miss Harrison, who I met long time ago, but for her courage and the things that happened to those people for over 50 years, it makes me proud to work in a profession and live in a state that has a law that says that such things are illegal. Also, the Zanesville case, which I testified in, incidentally, is also a good example of why we have the federal fair housing law, as well as Ohio fair housing law, to protect against those types of things. And I'm glad that we had a law that provided that type of relief. One of the things that's not said today is that some of those people passed away, as Ms. Harrison will tell you, waiting for water. They came into federal court with walkers and canes. These were humble people. Some of you might say, well, 50 years? How could somebody go 50 years because they were humble people? They were not the type of people to run to Ed immediately and complain about these types of things or to run to my type of agency. They took, they suffered immense indignities. Uh, we should all take pride that we live in a nation in a state that has a law that would correct such things. Um, having said that though, ladies and gentlemen, I wish that I could tell you today that the fair housing laws were no longer necessary and that Dr. King's dream of the, 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 the perfect society has somehow been reached, but obviously I'd be lying to you. And as you well know, if we, we stand today with an interesting backdrop in our country, you know, let's, let's be honest here now, what a few weeks ago, some idiot ran into a Jewish synagogue and killed 11 people there was also some idiot down in a suburb of Louisville that tried to first go into a black church and then in, ended up going into a Kroger, shooting someone, and then last but certainly not least, there was this attempt to send mail bombs to our political leaders. Um, I can only say to you the type of cases that we get and the things that I learn on a day-to-day -day basis, there are several other daily indignities that happen to people that you just don't read about in a newspaper. Um, we all need to be vigilant. We all need to be concerned about these things. It does affect your profession. Whenever these types of things happen in the communities, it has, not only, it does, not only does it harm the, the victims, it also harms that community. I'm from Cambridge, incidentally. I was born and raised proudly in Cambridge, Ohio, some 24 miles from Zanesville. It still, it still breaks my heart uh, to think that that happened in Zanesville because I walked those streets. I breathed that same air. I know those same people. Those are some high quality people in Zanesville, but those types of things sometimes unfairly tarnish and embarrass communities and affect sometimes the bottom line. Um, I would also say that some of the key cases that we see uh, today, um, I'll just say that they leave you with a heavy heart, but it, they also show you that there's a utility in having fair housing laws. Um, I'll start with what is a uh, it uh, seems to be on the daily things that I either see or learn some fact pattern if something happens to somebody. It's what I call nimbyism, not in my backyard. Um, I'll just, I'm, I'm, it causes me a heavy heart to say that uh, it seems like almost on a daily basis uh, I learn of some circumstance where somebody in a neighborhood, for example, uh, is intolerant of somebody else. And you do such things as, uh, for example, I know that there's a case where somebody painted, kill all Arabs on somebody's house. Uh, they do such things as call people names, um, engage in or attempt to engage in physicality with people, um, writing things to them, saying things to their kids and calling them names. That still goes on. And I think that when you're in the profession like you have, uh, you have a high obligation to make sure those types of things do not necessarily control the transaction. Um, we also have, uh, uh, I'll just give you an example, two miles from the State House in a place called Franklinton, where all you know, it's just over the, over the bridge there from downtown, uh, near that beautiful memorial that they're building for our soldiers, that they've built for our soldiers. There was an elderly black family that moved in Franklinton. 
And one day they came to me with tears in their eyes. They were about uh, 65, 70 years of age. They had a son that was a soldier. And they said that they moved there and that the neighbors had started throwing watermelon rinds in their driveway, calling them names on a day-to-day basis. There's one gentleman to her husband. They lived together, or at least the two of them. And he told me a story about sleeping near the door with a shotgun. Um, we went and joined both his next door neighbor and the neighbor that lived across the street using our fair housing laws. And it shows you that there are utility in these laws, even some 50 years after the passage of the Federal, Federal Fair Housing Act. Um, we also have had cases where in Cincinnati there was a landlord not long ago that hung up a sign that said at a pool, well, it was a common pool for theoretically for all the tenants that said that it was only whites only, a sign, a public sign that was attached to a gate that said whites only. And the reason why she did that was there was apparently a young lady that visiting her father who happened to be white because they had a previous relationship with a, 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 another minority female and the landlord believed that for her to use the pool would somehow pollute the water. So she therefore didn't want this young lady using the pool, so therefore she put the sign out there. Now, if you can think about that for a minute, the psychic harm, but my point is that these laws, whatever they exist, they exist to do precisely what it is that we did there. We stopped that sort of conduct. And we, the, sometimes the long arm of the law can reach out and make sure that others that are deprived of these things that we take for granted receive the same equal opportunity as us. Um, real quickly, I also am aware in a place called Bel Air, for those of you, I'm from Southeastern Ohio, as I said, a place in Bel Air, uh, where I work with the Department of Justice, the Federal Department of Justice, on a situation involving a landlord down there that, in effect, attempted to basically just run a family out of one of the dwellings that they were renting to him, which I've not been able to understand, but he did such things as a costume at high school football games, uh, what, tear up their, their uh, what, plants that they had, key their car, attempting to run them over. It's one of the few cases I've ever seen where the police officers, the local police officers, were ready to testify for and on behalf of the victims of discrimination because they had been called to this home so many times and had heard him say these things and also been witness to some of the acts. He also was also charged with ethnic, ethnic intimidation as well. Um, those types of things still go on. I only point that out to show that these laws have great utility and, 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 and it causes us great satisfaction. It should do for you too, in light of your profession, that to ensure that people can live wherever they want to live. I want to also say real quickly, uh, we also involved in a case involving a, a lender that you have a man and woman that go into a place to apply for a mortgage, the woman's pregnant, and the lender says, well, we're not going to cons consider your combined incomes because we presume that females that are pregnant will not return to work. Now, that's a stereotypical assumption that just doesn't hold water, and actually that's a prima facie violation of the Ohio Fair Housing Act and also the, the Federal Fair Housing Act. We saw to it that that policy was changed. Now, time does not permit me to talk about such things as sexual harassment that's occurring in housing any more than, I think, disability discrimination. I believe the judge is going to talk a little bit about disability discrimination today, but in closing, I just want to say that after 50 years, there's still a lot to do, but at the same time, when you have a group of committed men and women like you, um, I want to actually thank you for what it is that you do and urge you to continue to be vigilant I really enjoy what it is that I'm seeing here today, and I wish you luck. If there's anything that my agency can do for you proactively, call me. Don't wait until it's too late. We can reach out and assist you uh, through a particular situation if you want some advice and that type of thing. And thank you for your time and attention today. So I grew up as a missionary kid in Thailand, and we lived way up country. We had lived in little villages. I never really saw homelessness there. It was really more of an issue with Bangkok, uh, big cities, but I never lived in Bangkok. 
And, uh, but we had refugees, and that is the ultimate form of homelessness, I will tell you. So when I came to America at 18 and uh, went to college and law school and became a trial judge, I had never really seen or experienced mental illness until I became a trial judge, and then I saw it front and center. And I began to become aware that the hospitals had been closed in a well-meaning at attempt to give them the least restrictive environment, but they never created the least, least restrictive environment. And so our jails and prisons became the de facto mental health hospital. Uh, our Ohio prison system is the largest mental health hospital in Ohio. 70% of our forensic beds, our, be our beds, mental health beds in Ohio are taken by court cases, either trying to restore to competency or because they've been found guilty of insanity. So the bed count has greatly reduced, and so we have this large issue. And so I became very involved in working on issues of mental illness and criminal justice uh, over the last couple of decades. I left the Supreme Court six years ago to focus more fully on this. I do a little bit of consulting with the law firm of Vori Sater Seymour and Peace, Peace, telling them how to appeal cases. Uh, I love it, it's a lot of fun. I don't do any of the work myself, I just tell them what to do. It's a great job. Um, but most of what I do is working on issues of mental health with veterans, juveniles, and uh, jails particularly. Stepping Up was a national movement focused very heavily on Ohio. We are, the, I'm proud to say, the national leader in Stepping Up. We have, uh, counties have to invite us in to uh, participate, and then we go and do town hall meetings with them. It's a way too big a project to describe in uh, these few minutes. But all through the years I did this work on the Supreme Court, and now housing has been front and center, because every one of us realized if we didn't have a house, to send somebody back to, there was no good in value in treatment. They had to have the stable housing. So what I want to focus on is what we have learned, and I want you to take notes, because if you run across somebody in your practice that has possible mental health issues, these are some resources. First, veterans, VASH vouchers, Veterans Administrative Supportive Housing. It's like Section 8 Supportive Housing, except that you can have a criminal record as a veteran except for a sexual offense. And so if you have a veteran that's very low income, there are a certain number assigned to each state, and they have put a lot of resources into homelessness for veterans, so there's a lot of resources available. So look for the ability to connect with VASH vouchers. If you're contacted by somebody who has a criminal justice record that is um, a veteran, if they're going into, they've been arrested, you can contact the Veterans Justice Outreach Specialists. They are a project I started working on with the VA some 15 years ago, uh, not even that long ago, about 10, I guess. And it focuses on one person assigned to every single major hospital, VA hospital, whose main focus is to connect veterans that come into criminal justice with services. We have two per hospital in Ohio now. We have. 10, almost 11, but they've just, Congress just gave funding for a third to be added to every system. Huge resource, cuts through all the red tape, can get you right straight into the VASH vouchers, the housing resources, training, mental health. There's a ton of veteran services that you don't have to spend local dollars on if you have a veteran that is criminal justice involved or has a background. The other problem we have is hospitals can only keep them three, four, five, ten days at the max, and then they're let out. You don't treat somebody who's got cancer or has uh, had a major heart attack or a stroke and say, okay, uh, we've only got funding for five days and you're out in the street even though you're still deathly ill or very sick, but we do that with our people with mental illness. The recycling back into hospital systems or cycling into the jail systems is extremely high. It's about 60%. So we, uh, through NAMI and Terry Russell, started a project called the Adam Amanda Rehabilitation Center. This one is with, connected with the hospital systems in Athens. It provides a uh, center that they can go to to uh, stabilize when they get out of a hospital or, or jail for up to 90 days. Instead of getting kicked out at five, 10 days when they're still chronically ill, it takes a long time to get control of a mental health issue to adjust meds, et cetera. And so they can stay there up to 90 days. And then we're working on phase two, and that's been fully funded with a whole bunch of resources. But phase two is working on what happens next. If you finish that 90-day, where do you go? And we're working on, uh, we're try our goal is to get 80 units of supportive housing. We're up to 93 in that area. 
most every major hospital system in Ohio now has reached out and is interested in looking at having a similar center attached to their hospital rates. Because one hospital stay is about $1,500 a day, one day. Can you imagine how long you can put somebody up in housing for that one day cost? And it dramatically reduces the cycling in and out of hospitals and reduces their costs. Plus the statistics show that of people who come out of hospitals uh, have a very high suicide rate, 14 times the average. In fact, Amanda and Adam, who were the advocates who were w working on this, both despite all the help that we were trying to give them, both committed suicide. So another project is returning home. I've been working on this one for decades. Uh, we started it way back when I was on the court, and it's a national project as well. And it focuses on people coming out of prison with mental illness. Now we're doing it with jail with mental illness. Um, Mike DeWine, now to be Governor DeWine, and I co-chair the Attorney General Task Force on Mental Illness and Criminal Justice, and he gave us $500,000 from my hospital settlement to incentivize. We put $250,000 in, uh, in Hamilton County to fund returning home to provide housing for people that came out of mental health court, and that project is, is uh, alive and well in several places. Um, in Franklin County, since most of you, I believe, are Franklin County, we have the FUSE program, or familiar faces, as they like to call it, but the FUSE program is frequent users of the system. I worked on this nationally when I was on the National Corporation for Supportive Housing. The FUSE program takes a look at your highest users of your jail. And they started taking the top 50 users and adding up their costs. Their top user was a gentleman the records only went back to 1996, who had been arrested 240 times. He had been honorably discharged from the VA and had never accessed services. He was costing the county three to four million dollars in arrests, jail beds, hospital stays, etc. They're now working to try to get him in, in support of permanent housing and working with the VA on services. And, I don't have time to give you all the data from the Franklin County FUSE program, but it's astounding how much is spent on just 50 people and when you can reallocate that to housing. There's a statewide program called TCAP, a little bit controversial, but I'm a big believer in it. It helps take money from, instead of putting them at low-level felonies in prison, you keep them in a community and you treat them. Franklin County is using half of their TCAP money this year to fund housing for the FUSE population and that will make a huge difference financially down the road. And finally, one of the other things we're working on is a landlord mitigation fund. A lot of people are very afraid to uh, rent to persons with mental illness. I mean, if you combine them with any of the other issues like being biracial or being African American or being uh, refugees, or be that just magnifies the problem. But mental illness itself alone is a very scary thing. What happens if they decompensate? What happens if they get violent? What happens to the damage to my apartment? So we're working with the uh, Veterans um, uh, Ohio Housing Finance Authority, OFA, to start a landlord mitigation fund. This has been done elsewhere, where there's a fund available for landlords. And if they rent to somebody who has a mental health issue, that they can have access to those funds if some damage happens to their building and they don't have to go through trying to sue them and get the damages and apply for insurance. This fund is available and it encourages landlords to take risks to rent to persons with mental illness. I could talk for about five hours on all the other things we're doing, but I don't have time, so I want to give you a couple resources if you want to look these up more fully. We just did an all-day conference last uh, a week ago Monday on uh, resources for stepping up and housing was half of the morning. So slides and information on a lot of these housing issues, the mitigation fund, the Amanda Center are on the website, steppingupohio.org. There is a lot of other presentations that are on there and there are things called infographics, which are what we present when we go to the counties that talk about all the resources that are available and there's a lot of them on there. Or you could Google stepping up, uh, go to the uh, Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services website and just type in stepping up and the whole project comes up. Every explanation about it, every county, what's happening in the counties, what counties have signed up. Uh, it's very detailed, can give you lots of information. 
And if you specifically want help on the Franklin County project, um, we have retained Sally Lucan, who used to be head of Corporation for Supportive Housing in Ohio. She's now independent. And the PEGS Foundation that funds a lot of this work has retained her to be the Ohio consultant for a national project on housing and mental illness. And she's working on all of these projects that I just mentioned. Her, her email is sally.lucan, L-U-K-E-N, at lucansolutions, one word, dot com. And she can plug you into all of these projects uh, or work with you in many different ways. So there's just a lot of exciting stuff happen. I like to, I'm a half full person. I always like to believe in the best. When I started working on mental health courts, uh, there were uh, two in the country, or two in Ohio, six in the country, 22 drug courts. We now have over 286 specialized dockets. Every one of those dockets is a community relationship uh, group that is headed by a judge. And then we started with 100 officers trained in crisis intervention teams, where they train police officers how to respond to persons with mental illness. We started with 100 20 some years ago when I started pushing all of this, we have, in, we have now passed 10,000 officers trained in Ohio. So we are making progress and we are moving forward and I hope you'll be part of that movement. Thank you. Hi. Um, housing discrimination is real, it is rampant, and it is frequently brazen. Um, 2008, we just went through a play about how people thought it was peachy fine to give water to everybody but the African American community. That was 10 years ago. We're not talking about the medieval period, we're talking about 10 years ago, a decade. That's not very long ago. Uh, this stuff that you were hearing about, some of these cases that we were discussing, for example, this fiesta for Americans, that happens. It happens. People say it. I, you know, I got, this is rental season for the Ohio State campus, and I suppose other campuses, and I've already gotten numerous calls about landlords who just say, hey, well, I, I got an emotional support dog. Well, we don't take dogs. Well, I've got an emotional support dog. I don't care, period. I mean, people don't even try to hide it a lot of the time. There are laws against things like this. It is against the law, right? Um, and you guys, generally speaking, do a pretty good job with that. You get training in that regard. And, you know, you see the forms and you need to provide people with information about it. And a lot of people are like, hey, look, you know, housing discrimination is illegal. I believe in that. That matters to me. I want to follow the rules. Um, and, and I'm just going to do it. A lot of people don't take that view, either intentionally or implicitly. So now we get to my role as a litigator. We have a saying that a law without a remedy is a suggestion because there are no consequences um, for intentional discrimination or action. I am consequences. If we find people who intentionally discriminate, we can use the legal system to take action against them. You can also use the Ohio Civil Rights Commission. But in order for these laws to really take effect, People need to be very frightened about what happens if they do not comply. Now, you know, it's funny that I'm here. I am consequences. Be terrified by me. Right. Nonsense, right? Okay. Um, you know, I'm just some guy. But, the, um, but, you know, those things have to exist. And, you know, as I say, my litigative role is we bring and we file suit on behalf of people who have been victims of housing discrimination. Now, that's not as easy as it seems. We all have this idea that we go to the judicial system and we have our lawyer go out there and, it's, you know, it's, I'm not going to say Judge Judy, but something similar. You know, we're all going to, we're going to have a trial in six or seven days and we're going to call witnesses and, you know, this is going to be smooth sailing. That's not how it works. Um, I'm a believer in the civil justice system. I really am. 
Um, and in this great country, we have the ability to defend ourselves when lawsuits are brought against us, and that is right and that is just. But it ends up with the process taking about a year and a half before you'll ever see a jury, and there will probably be a good series of appeals after that even happens. These cases are not easy. Um, amazingly enough, the lady who said that, hey, it's like a fiesta for Americans, um, by the time we get to trial or the time we take her deposition or his deposition, um, they may have a different view on what they said. And we are relying on the legal system to figure out who's telling the truth and who isn't telling the truth. Um, here's the other thing. What are the consequences? Say you come and you hire Ed Foreman, right? And we say, hey, guys, we're going to file a lawsuit because this person you know, wouldn't, wouldn't rent to me, wouldn't sell to me. There was no open house. It was just some random fiesta, uh, something like that. Well, what happens? You come into my office, and I say, hi, it's nice to meet you. Um, and they say, okay, they said this was a fiesta for Americans. And I say, wow, that's incredibly racist and illegal. Um, what do we do about it? Well, the first thing is I'll probably send a letter to this person saying, hey, uh, you know, um, heads up, that's not legal and you need to do your job. Uh, if you ever get a letter for that, don't ignore it. Uh, ignoring that letter is the worst possible thing that you could possibly do. Um, and the other thing we might do is we might seek an injunction uh, against what's happened. You guys are very familiar with the idea that, you know, a real estate contract, every piece of real estate is considered to be one of a kind. Um, if you get in litigation with somebody over a title to a particular piece of property, it's not just um, money that you want or get. You know, you may want what we call specific performance, meaning that I want this particular house, and you can never compensate me for this house, which has this view of this oak tree that my great-great-grandfather planted in 1862 and faithfully watered for years. Um, that property has value to you, which may not be measurable just in cash. So sometimes what we do is we will seek an early injunction to prevent the sale to somebody else. Um, and we will try to get a temporary, actually, injunction isn't quite the word, a, a temporary restraining order at that stage. Um, and we would say, hey, court, this really looks like housing discrimination. I think we need to halt, halt this sale. Um, and then hopefully the sale will be halted, or maybe it won't. And then the case is going to go on for a considerable period of time. Um, now, but say you come in and you think I'm a great lawyer and, you know, I'm having a good day, so I do a good job for you. I'm having a good year and a half, so I win your case. Um, and uh, we go forward with something like that. Well, you know, what are the sort of things that you could be looking at? Well, to begin with, you know, we already brought up specific performance. We're going to say, no, nah, dude, you got to sell this guy the house because what you did was illegal. And, and for example, I'm, one of the consequences of the Zanesville action wasn't just money. It was like, all right, guys, the time has come to run water. Um, and, uh, you know, that's the sort of thing that we can get. Um, and we can get monetary damages. As you guys saw in that play, people were sitting around saying, this is how this affected me. You know, I was unable to move into this neighborhood. And as he was saying very succinctly and correctly earlier on, uh, being the victim of housing discrimination is not like, oh, golly gosh, well, I guess they discriminated against me. Let's move on to the next house. Um, no. It is damaging. It is very real. It is a significant psychological setback to somebody who has something like that. Uh, Justice Stratton was bringing up mental illness. You know, it's one thing to be suffering from significant mental illness and having a real hard time about it because that is real. And it is never recognized how damaging that is and how important it is that we do something about that. I'm thrilled to hear about what she's doing, by the way. I can't stress that enough. Um, but it's one thing to be going through that, and the next thing you know, you're having such a hard time, and somebody's like, oh, by the way, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to find a house, and we got somebody out there who's saying, oh, by the way, we just don't rent to crazy people, all right? It's not not that big of a deal. It's a big deal. It does hurt you, and it does cause damages, um, and, and that's the sort of thing that you can get. It's not just a matter of the house. It's not just a matter of lost money. It is compensatory damages for the emotional harm and difficulty that this sort of thing happens and this causes. And if you've ever been the victim of discrimination, you get it. It is serious. It does matter. And the other thing that you can get if you go forward is my absolute favorite part. I mean, this is, you know, what I just can't get enough of uh, and I think personally is the most important aspect of all housing discrimination, which is that you can get attorney fees. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
Um, I'm not cheap. Uh, the guys I work with are not cheap. Um, if you are looking at taking a case through all the way through trial, um, I would not be surprised if you end up, uh, you know, incurring plaintiff's attorney fees of $100,000, um, and, um, and you're probably going to end up paying your own attorney $100,000 to deal with it. So there are significant problems for people who discriminate. But the thing is this, if people don't take those actions, if you don't go out and hire an attorney, if you don't go to the Civil Rights Commission, these things don't get remedied, and they don't remedy, get remedied all the time. But bringing these cases is an act of incredible courage. I tell people who are victims of sexual harassment and things in their past, obligation does not spring from victimization. It is never fair to say to somebody, you were a victim, and therefore you need to go out and prosecute this and do something about it. That's not fair. It's not fair that to tell a victim of sexual harassment or sexual assault that it is your job, your obligation to come forward and do something about it. You've already been victimized. Now you're a bad person because you didn't go after it. You didn't prosecute it. You didn't care about it. You didn't move on it. That is wrong. It is not our expectation. It is unfair that victims have to do something. But that said, victims who do something about it are incredibly courageous and wonderful people. And if it didn't happen, we would never be effective. And I'm just going to close very briefly with this. I say obligations do not arise from victimization. But obligations do arise from privilege. And that is our duty. It is our duty to keep things like this from happening. Thank you. Sorry, long night, I dozed off in the back there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> Thank you very much. It's an honor to, he to be with you uh, this morning. I'm uh, Clarence Mingo, Auditor of Franklin County, and I will tell you, uh, only Sarah Walsh, the day after an election, could compel me uh, to be here. I've been away from my family for some time. I saw my two girls last night and forgot I had two girls. I thought I had a boy and a girl, but uh, I want to spend some time with you this morning uh, talking about race relations. I've had the privilege of uh, sitting in back, if you will, and uh, hearing uh, some of the remarks and presentations uh, from others. And um, I don't have to tell you uh, that race relations, really at this hour, is, is one of the seminal issues facing the United States of America. Indeed, uh, last night's election uh, nationally very much um, had touches and aspects and traces uh, of race relations being an issue built into the voting patterns that we've been studying at least in the last eight hours it's an interesting thing that, uh, is thinking back on, on the election, uh, you heard a lot uh, from national pundits uh, on both sides, Republicans and Democrats, who, who would say the chief issue is, is, is the economy. Uh, it's, it's always the economy. The, the economy is the beacon that drives voting patterns, and it's the number one issue in America often, at least in the minds of voters. I'm not always convinced that that is true. Um, I believe and I'm not saying this because I'm a person of color, but I think it is true that, that race relations, um, the, the very difficult tensions between black Americans and, and white Americans and, and the history of that uh, continues to be uh, the seminal, the greatest issue of our time. And I not only believe that is true for the United States of America, but I think it is true from a global uh, perspective or at least from a historical perspective. Uh, I'm going back to maybe 1933 to, to 1945, um, the year Adolf Hitler came into power. 
and uh, uh, the German dictator uh, swept uh, into high office uh, on a mandate um, and a promise uh, that uh, he would deal uh, with Jewish immigrants in, in Europe. And so we know factually, uh, because history tells us, uh, that more than six million Jewish souls perish in what we now call the Holocaust, and another seven million other individuals perished as, as well. And what's interesting about that is that that conflict, the Second World War, uh, and the very word Holocaust did not come because of a bad economy in Europe. It was not the result uh, of a great economy in Europe. It was the result of tensions built on a racial axis. I'm thinking about the conflict in the Middle East. I'm a veteran of the first Persian Gulf War, what you might recall as Desert Storm. I was with the 1st Infantry Division, um, and uh, we were uh, part of a coalition that liberated Kuwait. And um, I became aware uh, of how difficult um, racial relations, if you will, uh, can be, again, from a global perspective. Thinking back to the Middle East, I, I remember our Arab uh, and, and Muslim allies were, were um, filled with tension because you had this Western army uh, with Jewish soldiers on Arab soil fighting against an Arab nation. And the entire conflict in part and the tensions even between the soldiers was built, if you will, on a racial axis. Arabs, Muslims, if you will, versus Jews. I'm thinking about the conflict in Rwanda, the great genocide. Nearly two million, two million souls perished. 600,000 arms chopped off in a war that pitted Hutus versus Tutsis. Again, a conflict predicated on a racial axis. No talk of economy, no talk of jobs, no talk of employments. Grief and hardship inflicted. All of this built on a racial axis. And so that brings us here uh, to the United States of America, where even in 2018, we continue to struggle um, managing the, the, the differences and difficulties that exist between us. I'm thinking back over the last five years where in some cases we watched American cities burned, literally burn, uh, over an incident that may have involved a white police officer and a young black male, and in the center of the street is a young African-American body. And the questions abound, and, and, and why it happened uh, continues to be asked, and, and no solution seems to be found, but what we do see would be African-Americans on this side, white Americans on that side, and a question mark in the middle. I'm now going back to maybe 1996, or perhaps it was 1997. Um, the O.J. Simpson verdict. Now, I was a student at uh, Ohio State, and uh, my wife and I, Angela, we were in the student union the day that the, the O.J. Simpson verdict came down, and we were watching uh, the verdict uh, on monitors in the union. And you must understand the union on this day um, was decidedly segregated because over here were African Americans. Over there were uh, white students. And in the middle were Clarence and Angela Mingo, right? And the verdict comes down, and, and, and you know what the verdict was because history records this too. It was Judge Lance Ito. Uh, Orenthal, James Simpson, found not guilty. And I will never forget this because it left an undeniable mark on my heart and mind. On this side of the union, where my African-American peers were, uh, there were celebrations, and, and people were high-fiving, and, and, and it was a time of rejoicing. And on that side of the union, uh, where my fellow white Americans were, there were tears, and there were jeers, and it was shock and awe and hurt. And I was a law student at this time, and I remember thinking, um, even where justice is concerned, we as Americans can't seem to find common ground. Now, I knew a little boy uh, some time ago. This little boy grew up in a predominantly um, all-black housing project. And um, the little boy, um, one day, by, at age uh, six or seven, got on his bike and rode it about a half a mile down the road. It was him and another friend. And as they got down the road, they were surrounded by five uh, Five white men, one of whom pulled off a sawed-off shotgun. Uh, you're all adults, so brace yourself. Uh, the gentleman said, nigger, you have five seconds to run. And so the little boy did. He literally pedaled all the way back home. 
Now, sometime later, that little boy moved from that predominantly all-black housing project to a middle-class white neighborhood. And uh, there they encountered uh, a circumstance very similar to what they encountered previously. Because the neighbors on the left and the neighbors on the right would greet the family each morning with a very warm and affectionate, again, you are adults, so I can say this, good morning, nigger. Uh, another day, the little boy and his family woke up and the word nigger lover was spray painted on the house across the street. And then another morning, someone had burned uh, the impression of a cross uh, on their porch. And then they learned the homeowners association took out a petition uh, to have the family move out of the neighborhood. Um, I know this story well because it was the hot summer of uh, 1980, uh, and I was that little boy, one of six children born to Ruth and Clarence Mingo. And I remember this. Uh, my mother and father, uh, must have been July of 1980, standing on the back porch in light of all this, lecturing my siblings and I, reminding us that we were going to love and we were going to know our fellow white brethren and that we would make no distinction towards the many based on how the few may have treated us. And so that summer, my parents articulated the seminal remedy to race relations in the United States of America, and my father and mother would sum it up in two words, love and fellowship. Every single person you meet, you're going to figure out cause and occasion to love them. Every single person you meet, white, black, red, yellow, brown, whatever shape they may be, you will figure out cause and occasion and a path to have fellowship with them. And so as I stand here before you today, uh, that is the reason why within my own heart, there is no hate, there is no ill will, there is no animosity towards my fellow Americans who may not be people of color because my parents mandated love and fellowship as a path to resolve the very difficult tensions we experience as Americans, summed up in the phrase, race relations. And so now we need to begin giving thought going forward uh, as to what we can do um, right now at this hour um, to put a growing fire out. Uh, it may seem that uh, democracy um, in, in our nation with, with, with its rich history and our vast wealth, um, we are literally the founders of freedom we now have to begin giving thought to how we can preserve all of that so that the block called racial hostility as seen from one American against another uh, can be checked and held in abeyance so that all that we've worked for is not consumed. You need to think back to 1968. If there was ever a year that America was truly in peril, uh, it, it was that year. The war in Vietnam economic hardship, gross poverty, the loss of Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert F. Kennedy, and mixed into all of that was a chemical, an accelerant that burned and almost consumed the nation. And that accelerant, racial tensions and difficulties. So we have to work hard to preserve the American experience. And I'd like to take maybe four minutes to talk about uh, a few pathways by which we can do that. So let's start here, right? Um, law, law will not solve the problem. Law will not solve the differences that exist between we as Americans, black, white, or otherwise. Laws will not do that. Um, I'm thinking back on my own experience, and it is interesting that, that it was not a piece of civil rights legislation. It was not a law passed in the Justice Department or some measure of administrative code or a Supreme Court decision that altered the course of my life and that of my siblings. It was my parents, um, an in-home remedy, uh, gathering their children, saying, listen, I don't know what's happening in the streets, but this must be the mandate of your lives, love and fellowship. But mom, they're hurting me. Those white kids are really hurting me. Love and fellowship. And I'm going to say this, and I say this with all due respect. Uh, it wasn't Jesse Jackson. It, it, it wasn't Al Sharpton. Uh, it, it, it wasn't Barack Obama. Certainly was not Donald Trump. No man, no woman, no individual, no political figure, no liberal, no, no conservative, no Republican, no Democrat. Just my parents. Absent law instructing their children on how they must navigate this issue. And so I'm telling you this because in light of this election, 
If you believe uh, electing a gaggle of Republicans is going to change something with respect to this issue, or electing a bevy of Democrats uh, somehow will prove uh, more helpful and probative in resolving the issue of race relations, you're going to be disappointed because you must own the remedy, and you must own it within your family, and you must ensure that it is persuasive, alive, well, and heard, and understood in your own hearts and minds. We have to own this issue. So the law won't do it, we must take ownership. Now, if it is true that we must take ownership, it is also true that uh, this cannot be a collective effort. Um, this is why we pass laws, because we assume if, if we pass a law that says, listen, you can't discriminate, um, uh, tall white man, you have to you know, love young black woman, and uh, young black woman, listen, you gotta sit close to that young, black, or that young white male, it, 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 collectively it doesn't work that way because this issue of race relations, it's not a legal one, right? There's something insidious in our, in our hearts, me included, that makes us um, discriminate, uh, off-putting towards or otherwise uncomfortable with one another. Now, my mother would just call that sin. I don't know if I can say that up here, but okay, that's what she would call it, right? We just sort of have this cavity in our heart that leads us to say things to, to feel a certain way and to be hard towards others. It's not a legal thing. And uh, because it is not a legal thing, there cannot be a collective or broad solution. Uh, the solution must be individual. Uh, that means you and I, on any given day, uh, must find reason to come together. Um, you should ask yourselves, when is the last time, if you are in the audience today and you are not a person of color, that means if you're white, um, <laughs> when is the last time you had a breakfast, a lunch, or dinner with someone who was not of your ethnic background, who did not share in your culture, whose skin color was not perhaps like yours, whose dietary practices reflected something different. When is the last time you had someone in your home who did not look like you for purposes of pure fellowship? If you are black and you are in the audience today despite the history, when is the last time you took an affirmative step towards our fellow white Americans and said, you know what, I don't know you, but I want to make this thing happen. Let's do a lunch, a coffee, or breakfast for the purposes of fellowship so that we can know each other. I'm, I'm absolutely convinced, right? I've been in the political meetings. I've, 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 I've been around the consultants about this issue, and, and I'm telling you, uh, there is no broad or, or collective answer. It's you and I individually challenging one another and having a hunger to know one another beyond the social and racial and political boundaries that confine us. And so it is for that reason, once a quarter, I have a lunch with Sarah Walsh, right? <laughs> My family and I, we have this tradition. Every other Thanksgiving, we will invite a family into our home for Thanksgiving. And the rule is that family cannot be African-American. They have to be different for one reason, fellowship. And so to the extent that there is a solution to the very difficult issue of race relations in the United States of America, it will not be collective, but it must be individual, one relationship at a time, you and I coming together to know each other in a more meaningful and intimate way. I think another path forward uh, on this issue involves uh, simple understanding um, and sensitivity uh, to the issue itself because this issue of race relations, the tension that exists between us, it's difficult to talk about. I, 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 I know this. Um, I, I know people. I've been around people. If I said their names, you would know who they are because they're in the news every day. And I'm not talking about local news. I'm talking about national news. I, I know uh, giant figures who stumble and trip when they start talking about race relations. They're not sure where to start. They're not sure if they can say in front of their, their friends, uh, yeah, that shooting was a tragedy involving that young black man. They're not sure they can say, well, I think the, the, the police officer was justified in, 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 in doing what he did. Uh, they, they're not sure where to start. They, they almost trip when they say the name Martin Luther King Jr., and they're scared to say the phrase KKK because they might offend someone across the way. 
we have to be honest and sensitive in our conversation about this issue. And that also involves a measure of boldness. Listen, there are realities in our culture that we must accept, and we must accept them um, in flight to solving the problem. Well, what are those challenges? You need to hear me on this. Uh, Monisha or Monet, now she's going to have a more difficult time getting a job than Michael. Dante, Dante, on name alone, is going to be a little more challenged with his resume than Dan might be. And Abdul, I'm just saying, Abdul. Now this gentleman, this gentleman stands very little chance of having a competitive opportunity over young Amy. On name alone, sometimes we make judgments. On name alone, sometimes we develop perspective. And I can say this candidly because I'm guilty of the same. Um, I, I make judgments and, and, and I have uh, perceptions and, and there's this thing called implicit bias uh, where certain names or certain phrases or, or, or certain somethings compel me to think a certain way about things that I know very little about. And I'm not perfect at this, but I'm learning to be honest with myself and checking my own insecurities, my own biases, and sometimes those, ra- those biases are built or predicated along a racial axis. And I can tell you this as an African-American. I have to remind myself um, and be comfortable uh, with checking and challenging my own insecurities, my own prejudices and and biases, because they surely exist. They surely exist. And uh, as surely as we must be careful in acknowledging uh, 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 the truth, as between Michael and uh, Monet, Uh, we also have to be very fair and equitable in understanding about those who might be on the other side. Now, I'm going to say this because it needs to be said. Um, Listen, uh, white men are not the cause of every ill in America. Let me say that again. White men are not the cause of every ill in America. And uh, I've been in groups and meetings, especially in this political season, and, and I've been around my Republican friends and my Democratic friends and my black friends and some of my white friends. And, and it's, well, you know, I mean, it, this is a white male-dominated society. And, and listen, I'm not denying that, that, that there certainly are uh, historical patterns and, and there are prejudices and benefits and perks that, that some have been given while, while others have not. Some of that history is true. And like I said, we have to be honest and candid with ourselves and amongst our peers in discussing these issues. But we have to be very careful not to take the very handsome Brent Swander, right, and charge him, and charge him with the hardships and ills that others may have been inflicted as a result of some who perhaps look like him. So we have to be honest, sincere, and candid in our conversations, but also equitable and balanced in understanding um, and never charging those who do not deserve Uh, the tag as hurtful or or racist for things that they have not done. I would submit this to you as well. Uh, We have to run towards this problem and not away from it. It, it, This is an amazing thing. Every time there's a racial incident in the United States on the news, uh, excuse me, in the United States of America, and it's on the news, um, I get downtown, I'm having breakfast, lunch, or coffee with someone, sometimes Sarah Walsh, um, and it never comes up. It's, it's, it's an amazing thing. It's almost as if we are silent about it. And I think about this sometimes because um, when I'm with my black friends, right, we're, we're talking about it. Yeah, this is terrible. We got to do something about it. Uh, and I know my white peers privately, they, they, they talk about it. Well, this is awful. We have to do something about it. But when we come together, black American to white American, and we have that moment of fellowship, whether it's at the water cooler, at a Buckeye game, or elsewhere, never comes up. I'm just suggesting uh, that, that at moments like this, uh, at high points uh, in the American experience where, where the racial tensions are at a premium, we have to run towards that problem and then at that very moment begin having conversations about it. And I'm not talking about conversations about it at your all-black church. That's easy. Anybody can do that. I'm not talking about conversations about it at your all-white church. That's really easy, too. I'm talking about finding someone who does not look like you, who might be on the other side of the issue, and trying to construct a meaningful dialogue with them about it. That's called progress, and that will work. I'm standing here before you, 
Um, and I will tell you, I'm, I'm wounded. Um, uh, my heart aches. Um, and, and my spirits are mildly downcast. I was on the ballot last night for re-election. Um, and uh, and, and, and uh, it was God's grace that uh, he did not see fit to grant me a third term. And um, it stung. And it hurts. Uh, and it's, um, it's a confusing time for me, even at this moment. But I thought to myself, this very much is how we must approach this problem as with respect to race relations. I got up this morning and I am here with you having a conversation, no matter the hardship, no matter the pain. And you have to do the same thing as very, at various waypoints in the American experience when we as black Americans or white Americans or perhaps the people on this side of the wall or, or that side of the wall, right? When those tensions are at a premium, we can't be silent. We have to show up, stand before the podium, embrace the microphone and begin having a meaningful conversation about how we are going to get through this together. And so we have to be bold and run towards this problem. Finally, I would tell you this. Um, I mentioned it earlier, and I think it's true. Um, listen, I would encourage you to guard your own heart. I would encourage you to guard your own heart. Um, I can tell you this uh, candidly. Um, I have biases and, and prejudices, and some I don't even know that are there. It's, it's only after my wife points it out to me, um, or um, a young white female, or a, a big tall white male, or you know, a young Somali points it out to me, that the way you treated that person, the fact that you didn't even make eye contact, right? How slow you are in returning their call uh, because they don't work for the Columbus Partnership. Uh, but this person, right, you'll call that person back right away. Uh, how eloquent you are in a, uh, uh, an email um, uh, to someone of a certain socioeconomic status or, or to someone who can do something to you or to someone whose skin is brown versus how eloquent you are in an email uh, to someone who is not from your socioeconomic background, someone who perhaps is uh, not within your uh, ethnic makeup or, or origin. All of that uh, can be measured, and you have to guard your own heart, check your own soul, and be candid with yourself about your own prejudices and biases. I'm telling you, they are there, and they are hard to expunge, and you'll kill it one day, and it will resurface in another way tomorrow, but each day you have to slay that thing. I'm telling you, uh, if we do that individually, the collective result, the collective result will be a better Columbus, a better Franklin County, a better Ohio, and an outstanding United States of America. I believe this. Now, in closing, let me leave you with this, and, and I mean this. I absolutely mean this because I believe it is true. I know factually that uh, uh, this is in the Bible, that uh, discrimination and hardship, discrimination in its strongest form, uh, is only tolerable where the Michigan Wolverines are concerned. <laughs> I'm just saying. Somewhere in Genesis, I think, I don't know. Urban Meyer told me that. <laughs> I didn't bother to check, I just believed him. Um, all right, listen, I've been a bit serious, a bit candid with you, um, and, and, and I've been uh, so, I've been very bold um, with you uh, because this matters. This matters. There was around 1,000 people last night, and, and all of them pointing to the stage. Yeah, Mike DeWine, yeah, great, it's all going to change. Rich Cordray, yeah, it's all going to change. It's all going to be better. Um, I know Mike DeWine, he's an outstanding man. I'm just saying, I know him personally, he's a good man. I don't know Rich Cordray as well, um, but I have every reason to believe that he too equally is a solid and good soul. Uh, but despite their gifts and talents, despite my gifts and talents as auditor, um, that pendulum called race relations where black Americans and white Americans and, and many others swing, um, it won't move this way or, or that way uh, because of anything uh, done by an elected official, a jurist, passage of legislation. This issue only changes uh, when hearts and minds on an individual level uh, are committed 
dedicated to individual change, one relationship at a time. Hey, I'm Clarence Mingo. Love you guys. Thank you very much. Could we thank our panelists? So for the third portion, we are fortunate to have the executive director of the Ohio Mortgage Bankers Association, obviously someone who we know her husband very, very well, and most of us know her very well. We are grateful to have Mary Ann Collins here to talk about fair housing and lending. Pardon me, first we're going to have a break. <laughs> we are very fortunate this afternoon to, uh, or going into afternoon, to have the history of civil rights um, shared with us from a very knowledgeable perspective. Ronald Tomlinson is the director of the Housing Enforcement and Alternative Dispute Resolution with the Ohio Civil Rights Commission. And uh, he was gracious enough to happily want to be involved with Executive Director um, Peyton. So with that, we'll have him share. You know, I was saying to myself that um, now I've got to follow Mingo. <laughs> so as I sat out there in the audience, I was like, OK, boy, you better bring it. But um, you know. Over the last couple of days, um, to Monday I was in Dayton. Uh, they were worried about whether my voice would carry. It will certainly carry. Um, but on Monday I was in Dayton with Access Center for, for Independent Living. Uh, yesterday I was at the OFA conference uh, doing some stuff on fair housing there. And uh, at the midpoint of the day, I was at the Supreme Court doing mediation uh, coaching. Uh, because they contacted me yesterday and said, hey, we've got two coaches who counseled on us yesterday. So I just said, you know what, let's just keep moving, okay? Um, it is a pleasure to be here today. It is a pleasure for me always to be talking about fair housing, okay? Um, and fair housing in some sense found me as opposed to me finding fair housing. Um, my executive director, G. Michael Payton, remembers that at some point he was the director of operations and the Executive Director Melanie Mitchell had a bright idea. She determined that I should be the person overseeing housing, and this is more than 22 years ago. Now, let me let you know that when she made that decision, I had zero experience dealing with fair housing, okay? Did my law school thing at Capital Law University. Concentration was on employment law. And when they told me I was gonna be doing fair housing, I was literally lost for a brief period of time, but there were people involved in fair housing at, at that time when I came into it who were my mentors. And I've seen many of those people retire. And I woke up the other day and realized I've now become one of those elders. <laughs> it's not something you look to, to do. It's not something you sign up for. You know, longevity is always a wonderful thing. So what I want to do this morning is I want to talk a little bit about history of civil rights you know, and some of this I'm going to be hitting for housing. Some of this I'm going to do a little bit about ADA. Some of this I will talk about a little bit of employment, okay? Because all of these things are closely connected, okay? But for sure, to me, the most important statute that's out there is the Fair Housing Act, which was passed in 1968, April 11th, 50 years ago. And we get the luxury of being the tail end of the year to sort of do the cleanup. Okay? So if you will, for a second, think of me, Ron L. Tomlinson, and I'll go ahead and tell you I was born in 1961. That was many years ago. So I was a baby when the Civil Rights Act of 64 was passed and the Fair Housing Act of 68 was passed. I'll even tell you that I harbored some real strange thoughts in my mind because I did, what was, I did not know that I was going to be doing civil rights. Okay? And 
when I first started doing some of this stuff, I started thinking about how do we, how do we, what, why are we still doing this, some of this stuff? And at some point I realized it's this little thing that we call stereotypical assumptions of what's presenting, okay? I had someone over at uh, Current Institute said to me, three twelves. From 12 feet away, I'm gonna be making some determination about who you are. From 12 inches away, I can smell whether you're wearing cologne, perfume, I can see your eyes. And then he said, you know what? The next 12 words that come out of your mouth are so important because we make some determinations about whether I'm going to like you. As I tell people when I once had long braids, I knew that when I would walk into a room, some folks may have thought something positive about me, some may have thought something negative, and then some may have been just, just neutral. And it is human nature. Uh, to piggyback on what Mingo was saying, which is, we will never stop having these thoughts in our mind, okay? That will always happen. We're part of the animal kingdom just like the dogs and the cats. I use that because when you see dogs, they size each other up. Humans have intellect. Humans have thought. Humans can then uh, check what they're about to do and what they're going to say, okay? So let's drift back a little bit. Oh, I forgot to say, I was born in Waco, Texas, and I'm very proud of that. But about two years ago, I actually heard about a lynching in my hometown. And I did not know that it existed. Now, mind you, I've been doing this work for 22 plus years. And I've done research and all these kinds of things, looking at all kinds of things that are out there in terms of civil rights. And I just recently found out. My mother nor my grandfather told me about this. And I think on some level, they were sparing me and they wanted me to not know some of these horrors so that I could one day be here standing before you talking about civil rights and talking about fair housing. Because I know that if I knew some of this stuff, it may have impacted me negatively in my thought process. So let's go back to 1857, the old Dred Scott decision, okay? So this is before the Civil War, which is in 1861, okay? And with that particular Supreme Court case, and sometimes I tell people, and Michael, love you dearly, and I know you love attorneys, and there's other attorneys in the room, but this is where I say to you, you don't have to be an attorney to make the right decision, okay? Because in the Dred Scott decision, these were all Supreme Court justices, all of them are attorneys, and they deemed back then that me, if I was back in that time period, because remember I was born in 61, that I am not even, basically not a person, I am inferior to whites, uh, that you must keep me separate from everyone else. And when you go back and read some of what the, what the justice was saying in this thing, it's really hard for me to understand. However, we are dealing with property. Housing is property. And so African Americans back in that day were considered nothing more than property. And we all know that you increase wealth by having property, regardless of what that property is. So this is the status of the U.S. in 1857. Then, 1865, we get the 13th Amendment, the abolishing slavery, okay? So here we are in 1865. And then when I go through some of these statutes, I get really excited because shortly after 1865, in 1866, because you're thinking the first Fair Housing Act was in 1968. You may be thinking that at some point when um, Kennedy was alive, he did pass something in fair housing, okay? But if we go back to 1866, the Civil Rights Act, April 9th, 1866, it stated this, citizens of every race and color shall have the same right in every state and territory to lease, to sell, to hold, and to convey real and personal property as enjoined by white citizens. That was the first Fair Housing Act that existed in the law books, okay? 1865. Now, we think about where we are today, we think about the Fair Housing Act being passed in 68, and we kind of go, what happened, Ronell? Did the train get derailed? No, it did not get derailed in 1866 because the 14th Amendment was passed in 1868, okay? And I'm pretty certain we've all heard over the last several days a little bit about the 14th Amendment. You know, that if you're born in the United States, you're a citizen, okay? And so the 14th Amendment 
in essence, was undoing the Dred Scott decision because then you could not be considered a citizen of the United States back then if you were African American. So the 14th Amendment did that, but it also stated, and which is what I really love, because those of us who did con law, oh, the 14th Amendment was one of the most wonderful tools that was there, which is that you could not have the state be a participant in the uh, abridgment of people's rights, okay? You couldn't have the states. So we, slavery in 1865, 13th Amendment, we've got the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which says that I can now sell and convey real and personal property, the same as whites, and then we get the wonderful 14th Amendment, which is in 1868. And then we should have been in utopia, correct? Everything should have been hunky-dory, as we'd say, okay? But then along came Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896. And sometimes when I talk about this stuff, I know sometimes we feel like, Ron Hill, why do we have to go back and revisit this stuff, okay? But we absolutely need to understand exactly what was going on. Because the act of discrimination that was in the country at this time period, because uh, I recently did some other research and realized that a lot of the founding fathers owned slaves, okay? And so we have to stop and think about what's going on at that time period. So Plessy versus Ferguson, the doctrine of separate but equal, indicating that as long as there's a facility, and you know they did state that it needed to be equal, but we all know that that was not the truth, okay? So then we move forward and we end up with the Fair Housing Administration back in the 30s. Uh, me and Michael have had the privilege of sitting down and talking with a gentleman from California named Richard Rothstein, and he talks about what the F Federal Housing Administration was doing, that for more than 30 to 40 years, from the 30s coming up to the Fair Housing Act being passed in 68, that it had a policy in its manual that indicated that if you're gonna be buying a home and you're moving to the suburbs, that you could not the, the federal government would not underwrite those loans if it was going to be sold to an African-American. One of those towns is Levittown, which he uses in his book, The Color of Law, okay? And this existed for a long time. So I don't want you to ever feel like that it was just individual people who were then doing things that were discriminatory because the federal government played a very integral role in this, okay? And so this went on for more than 30 or 40 years. You know, we think about in terms of housing, that you own a home, you then can pass it on from one generation to the next, inheritance and so forth. So imagine what's happening. Well, also during this period of time, that when it came to building subsidized homes, okay, that the government had a policy that was discriminatory in and of itself because it wasn't building these homes for people of all colors and races, it was separating people by races, okay? which is really kind of odd. You don't really think of the government playing that big of a role. We know that these Supreme Court cases that were out there from Plessy versus Ferguson as well as Dred Scott, we know what that was, but I didn't know about any of this stuff, okay? Because we're not teaching it in the history books. It's not there. But it's so vitally important to understand as to why we have these segregated housing patterns today, because that's what existed. There's also these things that we talk about in terms of redlining that were going on as well. There were restrictive covenants as well. There was a Supreme Court case called Shelley versus Kramer that was in 1948 that ended restrictive covenants, okay? You know, I begin to realize that some of this stuff dealing with homeowners associations, and I'm not knocking them, okay? No different than the um, condo associations, okay? But some of that was started as a consequence to make sure that whites within those neighborhoods would all stay together and adhere to those restrictive covenants to make sure that you would not be selling that to someone who may be African-American, who may be Hispanic, who may be Asian, who may be Jewish, okay? So as we move forward, we're now into 1948, and then of course we know there comes Brown versus Board. Brown versus Board of Education, 1954. And I remember early in the session, we were, someone was talking about it in terms of, we, do, the laws, we don't, do we need the laws to do this, okay? We absolutely do. But always note that whenever you have these cases that are there, just because it got passed in 1954 doesn't mean that it happened. 
I recall this so vividly because my oldest brother was born in 1954. Waco integrated the school system in 1972. He never, being born in 1954, ever had the opportunity that I had, that I had, to go to an integrated school system, to go to a school where the books are, are, are nicer and so forth. He was born in 1954, in May of 1954, which is, it was rather, very disturbing for me because I look at my oldest brother and he sometimes would think, okay, what was life, life been like for you? Because my life has been enhanced as a consequence of these statues that exist. So then we get to 1962 and we got President Kennedy who issues an executive order guaranteeing equal housing opportunity in FHA and VA financed housing. And along comes the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Okay? When I look back and look at the videos of Lyndon B. Johnson from my home state of Texas, with the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65, the Fair Housing Act of 68. If you haven't heard him speak about the reason why we need these statutes to be here, these acts to be there, you need to just Google it and find it on YouTube, okay? I elected not to do a video today because yesterday we did a montage of videos yesterday over at OFA. So I was sort of like going, okay, I don't wanna do that. Okay, we, I, I've seen enough of that. But you really owe it to yourself. And the reason I'm telling you this is that we are like-minded in this room, okay? But we, as a group, need to collectively talk to the other folks and explain this history to them so they will begin to understand that there is a deeply rooted system of discrimination that exists in this nation. And when sometimes I hear people talking about affirmative action, if you go back to what the Fair Housing Administration was doing with respect to moving people building homes in the suburbs to the exclusion of blacks and Hispanics and Jews and so forth, that was affirmative action. You were affirmatively moving one group forward as opposed to the other, okay? So, Civil Rights Act. We think of it just being about employment as well, okay? But it also banned discrimination in all places of public accommodation, including courthouses, parks, restaurants, theaters, sports arenas, and hotels. No longer could blacks and other minorities be denied, be denied, be denied service based on the color of their skin. So we oftentimes think of the 64 Civil Rights Act of being Title VII, which is employment, just like Title VIII, which is housing, but it also had and covered places of public accommodation. Uh, then we move forward to the pivotal year, the Civil Rights Act of 1968. And so, based upon what you're hearing now, do you think there was a need to pass the Fair Housing Act? As Mingo said, 68 was a tumultuous year, okay? There was the Warren Commission that issued its report back in February, talking about how this nation was divided in terms of where, where people lived, in terms of where people worked, and that report that, that President uh, uh, Johnson uh, uh, secured, it told them that if we continue this way as a nation, we will not survive as a nation. It was warning everyone that here, here's where it is, okay? So then as we go through 68, we get past the, that, that particular report, we get to the assassination of Martin Luther King, April 4th. Then seven days later, we finally get a housing bill pushed through. But you know, there's something about the Fair Housing Act in 1968 because I don't really like the exemptions. There's two of those exemptions that I really don't like on the federal level. One is uh, Ms. Murphy, which says that if I am some person who has a house and I'm renting it out to other people and as long as I reside there, okay, that I can choose who I'm gonna rent to. Now imagine, you're passing a, a, the, six, the, the Fair Housing Act in 1968 because you're trying to eliminate discrimination and yet the government created a loophole to where you could continue to do the very thing that the Fair Housing Act stood for which was saying that you could not, okay? And Ms. Murphy was not a real person. This was a fictitious person that did not exist. As G. Michael Payton likes to say, he calls that a problem looking for a solution. There was no problem there. And then there's that single family residence exemption that permits me as someone who owns a house to be able to say, you know what, over a two year stretch, if I own several different houses, I can sell one every two years and I can sell it to whoever I choose. And I don't have to worry about the Fair Housing Act. 
you know, the crux of the Fair Housing Act in 68 was about saying you have a group of individuals who have been, de been denied, okay? And in, and in 68, it was not just blacks. It was uh, Jews. It was Hispanics, okay? It was anyone that was non-white. So you then allow for this exemption to exist to where if I'm selling this house, I have this exemption that every two years I can sell this house and I do not have to abide by anything that's in the Fair Housing Act. That should not have happened. But as we well know, when you're passing legislation, sometimes you have to take what you can get, okay? And so there were some compromises being made. Many of these, these two solutions that were there, which is the the uh, Miss Murphy, and as well as the single family residents, these were things that, was, that Southern folks that were politicians needed to have in there for them to sign off on the act, okay? But it would be really lovely at some point we would eliminate that. Now, with the House of Rights Commission, which is the agency I've been working with for 22 years, we don't have such an exemption, okay? Miss Murphy doesn't exist, we will prosecute the case. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we will investigate the case. Prosecuting is left to the Attorney General's office, okay? I overstepped my authority there. And we'll do the same thing on the single family residents. Um, as we move forward, there's another act that was out there dealing with havens, which is talking about individuals who might be injured as a consequence of being testers, okay? Then in, I'm sorry, let me back up for a second. When the Fair Housing Act was passed in 68, it, did, it lacked teeth. There was no enforcement mechanism. So you might wonder why in 1988 it was amended because there was zero enforcement mechanism that existed to do what it was saying it, 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 it was supposed to be doing. There was nothing in there, okay? And then they also added familiar status and disability, okay? And, you know, again, I told you, Ron Elvis was not always a good guy, okay? Because when that passed on familiar status, I remember living in Dallas, Texas. I remember that for years you could have an adults-only apartment complex and you could be free and clear of kids, okay? And if they did have kids in that apartment complex, guess what? You would be relegated to the worst sections of the apartment complex. Well, this is before I came to the House of Rights Commission to work. And guess what I thought? I actually thought that my life was gonna be uniquely impacted negatively because there would be families with children living in my apartment complex. I'm, I'm admitting this to you, okay? This is my mindset, okay? But this is still the mindset that we deal with at, the, at this agency that I work for in today's world is that people still have that stilted way of looking at it. Because you're thinking that, okay, you, you being here, all of a sudden we think of the horrible things that we think that kids can do. And you know what, it's really awful because we all were children at one day in our life, okay? You don't, you don't leave this world without being a child, okay? And it's really incredible to think that in this nation, you had in, 19, in 1988 adding familiar status to there. Okay? Because that discrimination was going on. So when you look at these statutes and they put in these what we call protected classes, one of the things I always tell people is that we all in this room are a member of this protected class. Okay? None of, I don't have any sole right to it as being an African American. Marianne, you don't have any sole right to being a female. Okay? It, it's every single one of us. It encompasses every single one of us. Okay? It is neutral in terms of what it does. Because I know that I get these calls from time to time and people will say to me, Ronell, I'm white. What can the Civil Rights Commission do for me? And I'm like, look, we're just talking about comp comparable treatment. You know, if you're a male and females are being treated more favorably, guess what? You probably will win that case with us. That's how basic it is. So when I talk about these Civil Rights Acts, the one disheartening thing for me is that in 64, we did employment. In 64, we did places of public accommodation. In 68, we did for housing. We waited nearly a quarter of a freaking century to pass the ADA. 25 nearly years went by. And it's very disheartening because in the work that I do, I do a lot of cases on disability, okay? And here's what one of my friends told me years ago, which made me become more passionate about the work that I do. Because he heard me talking about fair housing in my primary place to live. And he'd seen me get up and do these presentations again and again and again. His name is Derek Mortland. He'd been working for several disability organizations through Columbus and the state of Ohio for years. He's a paraplegic. He can scuba dive. I don't even swim. 
And one day when I got done, he came up to me and said to me, Ronell, you always talk about my primary living space. And he said to me, it impacts who I can freely associate with. When he said those powerful words to me, I changed. I became a lot different in terms of the work that I do for the agency because he made it not only personal, but he put it in a way for which I could not let it get out of my mind. And I knew that every time I do a presentation and I move towards disability, I'm gonna tell you folks the same thing that you told me, which is it impacts who I can freely associate with. You know why? The obstacles that exist. I oftentimes will say, must I continue to fight for a disabled parking space? Can I please, before I retire, get done with fighting for a disabled parking space? Because I'm like, really? We still get those cases because of the disabled parking space. It doesn't make any sense, okay? And if we can just get past that little thing, we will be a whole lot better in terms of dealing with stuff with disabilities. You know, we had a case that was down in um, Washington Courthouse. I remember this case so vividly because this young woman had been living in this apartment complex for more than 18 years of her life. She had MS, a disease that slowly deteriorates the muscles of the body. So when she finally got to this point where she was needing a ramp, her doctor gave her a note, which is what you need to have in terms of a reasonable accommodation or reasonable modification. You need to have a note from a doctor that indicates you're a person with a disability and you need this requested accommodation or this modification because of your disability. And the note indicated that she, would, she can no longer walk long distances and she could not do steps and stairs. So for more than three months, the owners of the property could not provide her an answer as to why they were not permitting her to go ahead and build a ramp. And oh, by the way, when you look at the Fair Housing Act and you look at housing that's been built, okay, most of the available housing stock that we have today was built before the ADA was put in place. So the stuff that deals with new construction, accessible design, that came along in 1991. So probably 80 to 85% of the existing housing stock was built before then. So imagine the folks with disabilities who cannot get access to a place to live. So there's a part of the Fair Housing Act and the State's Fair Housing Act that allows you to request modifications to that structure. So they came back with this response, which stated that we are not a disability facility, we never have been, and we do not advertise to be. Our insurance will only, allow, our liability insurance will only allow us to, to permit you to have a temporary ramp that has to be removed after each usage. And then they followed it up with, we hope that this addresses all concerns that you may have that we are a disability facility. And when the case came to us in 2002, I was scratching my head because Google had been around for a long time, okay, a very long time in 2002. And I could not even imagine how a housing provider could actually send someone a note such as that. And one of the things they stated to us in their defense was, if we saw her standing in the window as their justification that she didn't need the ramp, we saw her standing in the window. And then in their, what we call the position statement, they went on to state that neither the grounds or the units were ever designed to house disabled individuals and certain equipment, and they put in little brackets, wheelchairs. And I just kept scratching my head going, this is a tenant of yours who's been there for 18 years. The dialogue shouldn't go that way. And essentially all they needed to do was Google reasonable modification. And they would have found out that the simple response they needed to do was a simple yes. Because it was built before 1991 when new construction kicked in for apartment complexes and multifamily complexes to where it would be her cost to have the ramp constructed, get the contractor, do all the bells and whistles. All they needed to do was say one simple word, which was yes. And I tell all housing providers in my trainings, if you have that reasonable modification request, if you don't have federal dollars flowing into it, which means that you would then cover some of this stuff, I need you to just say one word, which is yes, to that person who needs that modification so they can have full use and enjoyment of that particular apartment that they're living in or that residential home that they're living in. And I don't want to hear stuff about aesthetically pleasing because I've seen individuals who stated that 
the ramp that's there because it was a condo situation and the condo has this wonderful trim that is all a certain color, that can you now paint the ramp that color? And I'm like, that's all wrong. Why are you gonna be painting a ramp to be a certain color? That doesn't make any sense, okay? So in closing, please understand that in the work that we do, and we're talking about individuals based upon race, let's not forget the group of individuals who have long suffered as a consequence of us not understanding what they're going through, okay? Because my work with the agency, I have worked with so many different people with various disabilities, it has actually opened my eyes and have allowed me to give you a message that I can explain to you in terms of what they're going through. And just remember, as Dirk said, it impacts who I can freely associate with in terms of my housing choice, in terms of the apartment that I'm living in. Thank you. <laughs>